Hi. When you see an animal like this, you will very likely think on Australia, don't you? Because Australia is more or less the only place on this earth where you can find kangaroos. But the thing is, and perhaps you don't even know it, there is an animal you only find in Germany, or to be more precise, in German-speaking countries. It's this guy here, the egg-laying woolly milk pig. Okay, it's, it's not an actual animal, it is more of a metaphor used in the German language to talk about a product that is capable of everything, like a Swiss army knife and a bit more capable of everything. And if we take this very metaphor, that is, by the way, quite funny, if you ask me, and if we transfer it to the world of micro frontends, we would end up with having several frontends that can be implemented by several teams. And each and every team now even has the freedom to use its only tech stack, its only framework, its only libraries. They have the maximum amount of uh, of freedom and so what they get is a creature like the creature you've seen before. Or perhaps even a Frankenstein monster, I don't know. And if you ask me how can we implement such an architecture that uses different tiny applications using different frameworks, then I have to tell you, well, you just have to align with one rule. I'm calling it the golden rule of multi-framework, multi-version micro frontends. And this rule is, yeah, don't do it, right? Don't do it because uh, it is everything but straightforward. You are combining frameworks that have not been intended to be combined with each other. And so even though it's possible, you will have a hard time. Yeah, that's it for me. So thanks for having me. What do you say? Well, oh, oh, 40 minutes. Okay, okay. So uh, in this case, let's go on. So uh, perhaps you are saying, well, perhaps I have some good reasons for doing this. I mean, you cannot say in general, this is a good or a bad architecture. So what might be the reasons for doing something like this? Well, if you ask me, one reason is migrating from one tech stack to another one. Perhaps you've heard the rumor, Angular in version 1, AngularJS, is a different framework than Angular in version 2 and upwards, the current version is 12. And so we need to have some kind of migration if we want to move an existing huge application from Angular 1 to Angular 2 and upwards. And here using micro frontends to migrate something step by step is very tempting. You keep the old stuff as is and you add new domains with your new frameworks. Perhaps this is in general a good idea and also a characteristic of an architecture that is most of the time ignored. Namely the question, how can we get rid of this after a decade plus minus give or take? Because one reason is for sure, you will have a business product and this business product will very likely live longer than one decade. But most of the frameworks have a lifetime of a decade, give or take. So thinking upfront about how can we get rid of it might be a smart idea. So this might be one reason. By the way, I know there is something like ng-upgrade and ng-upgrade is really a great library, but it intermingles your Angular 1 parts with Angular 2 parts. And this intermingling is sometimes needed and totally fine if everything is dependent upon everything else or if a lot of stuff is dependent upon other stuff then intermingling is necessary but if you don't want to couple everything together if you manage somehow to nicely separate your business domains just adding a new business domain with a new tech stack and integrating it into an existing common hall is quite a nice idea, isn't it? Another reason might be you have a merger. 
you are merging two different companies, two different banks, insurance companies, stuff like this. And for some reason, people in the one company worked with a different framework than people in the other company. And yeah, so perhaps now you need to integrate this. You need to bring this together because users usually want to have one integrated solution. So as you see here, even though mixing and matching versions and even frameworks is not perfect, sometimes it's really needed. Sometimes you have a good reason for it. So now the big question is how can we implement an architecture like this? And this is the question I want to answer today. For this, I have prepared several chapters. In the first chapter, we will talk about module federation in general. I'm going quickly through those slides. I only have three slides for this because I talked quite a lot about this topic recently. So let's cut it to three slides. Then we will talk about web components in general. And then I want to show you how you can combine those both mechanisms to get a solution for our needs. This is what I will show you in the demonstration. And this also leads to some pitfalls, to some ugly pitfalls you should avoid when going down this road. But first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Manfred. I am a trainer and consultant for Angular. I'm focusing on Angular in the enterprise. And besides this, I'm quite connected to the Angular community. If you are wondering where this accent comes from, where this accent comes from Austria, but I'm also doing a lot of stuff in Germany and I'm always happy if I can work together with people around the world. Nowadays, this is done remotely, which makes it far more easy. Okay, let's get started with the first chapter. Starting with the first chapter is such a nice habit, so let's do it. So this is about Mapback 5 module federation. And the basic idea of module federation is doing something like this, loading something that has been separately compiled, perhaps even by a different team, and separately deployed. The thing is, doing something like this is everything but easy. And the reason are modern bundlers like Webpack or the CLI using Webpack. Those bundlers try to squeeze out the last byte of your bundles to make very tiny bundles. And that's why they compile everything together. They compile everything together. They optimize everything together. Think on tree shaking, for instance. That's why we cannot just load something on runtime we did not know on compile time. And this issue is solved by Webpack 5, which ships with Angular CLI 12 and Module Federation, which is an integrated part of Webpack 5 and upwards. So if we go with Webpack 5, we get two roles. The first role is the host. The second role is the so-called remote. The host is our micro frontend shell. The thing that loads other micro frontends, in our case, micro frontends that use different frameworks. And the remote is our micro frontend itself, something that is deployed to a remote, something that is loaded from there at runtime. We are really doing runtime integration. Well, both can be configured. You can map an URL that points from the shell to the micro frontend. And when mapping an URL, you can even define the name of the micro frontend over there. So here I'm saying, well, what's called MFE1 here, it's also called MFE1 over there. And over there, I can expose files. Exposing files means I'm exporting files for the shell and or for other micro frontends. They can directly load them on runtime. In this case, I'm exposing a component and the component gets a pretty name mapped CMB, but I can expose almost everything. Components, services, modules, just functions. It's really up to you. If TypeScript understands it or 
ECMA script at the end of the day, also module federation will understand it. And now we have something that's really beautiful, namely we can use just a dynamic import, just a dynamic import to load something from over there. And this is pretty cool because because of this, Angular is not even recognizing that you are loading something that has been separately compiled and separately deployed. From Angular's perspective, from Fuse's perspective, from React's perspective, from your leading framework's perspective, this is just lazy loading. That means you don't need any extras, you just use your leading framework as is and you get micro frontends automatically. This is pretty cool because that means you don't need any extra frameworks orchestrating your micro frontends in your browser window. No, just use your leading framework as is. Another nice feature, I really love this, is you can even share dependencies. You can say, well, I'm using Angular on this side, I'm using Angular on that side, so why not just load it once and share it? Like with the neighbor, we have a common newspaper with. I get it in the morning, they get it in the afternoon, we only need to buy it once. Just an example. And this happens here and this is vital because just because of having 10 micro frontends, uh, I don't want to load Angular, React, View and the other stuff 10 times. Would be quite an overhead, wouldn't it? No, we just load it once and that's it. Of course, I hear you saying, well, that can lead to version conflicts. And my answer is yes, that can lead to version conflicts. However, module federation has some pretty clever mechanisms. You can configure them to deal with version conflicts. So, module federation got your covered. Okay, so much for the first part. Now, let's go on with the second part. It's about web components in general. And I think almost every one of us heard about web components, don't we? Basically, it's about writing a component that can be reused with each and every JavaScript framework. And even with vanilla JS. So somehow the philosophy of Java holds true here. And at the heart of web components, there is a standard that is called custom elements. As the name implies, with a custom element, you can write your own HTML element, an own element like table, diff or image. It's even treated in the same way like those common elements. Most people refer to custom elements when they use the general purpose umbrella term web component. And writing a custom element is really drop death easy with new ECMAScript, with ECMAScript 2015 and upwards. Just extend HTML element or another class that is flying around in your dome and implement some so-called callbacks, like the connected callback. And this callback can now write the contents of the web component into the DOM. A very simple example. After that, you can register this web component, this custom element with your browser. For this, you're going with this API. And this gives your element a pretty HTML tag, like my element. By the way, Little hint, there needs to be a slash in there. I think it's done to avoid naming conflicts with other pre-existing elements. So don't forget about not the slash, the dash, I meant a dash, this, this guy here. Otherwise, some browsers will throw an exception. When I first tried this out, I did not know this. I lost a lot of time. A lot of time I will never get back, so don't do this mistake. Okay, when you have this, then you perhaps are saying, well, that's nice, Manfred, but I have an Angular component or a whole Angular application or React or Vue, and I want to package this up as a web component, as a custom element. And yeah, that's totally possible. 
Some frameworks come with built-in support for this. The Vue CLI, for instance, has built-in support for doing this. Even Angular with Angular elements. For React, there are community projects. And at the end of the day, no one prevents you from doing something like this. No one prevents you from just bootstrapping your component, your application in the inside of a custom element. It's really as easy as that. Yeah, now you can bundle everything nicely up, load the bundle into this or that application. It does not matter which framework you're using there and then you can use your element this year. Or you can even go more dynamic. You can use a script loader. Please forgive me, this here is the simple script loader you find under this big sky here, namely just creating a dynamic script tag and pointing to this or that bundle. Under the hoods, something like this is always used, but you know, normally you will abstract something like this away. And if you, or when you have loaded this bundle, you uh, can dynamically create your custom element. Here I'm creating the element, my element, and I'm putting it into the dome. It's really as easy as that. Just adding it to the dome, you are using code that looks like code we used about 20 years ago. Yeah, I know we are not used to this anymore, but under the hood, something like this always happens. Okay, so much about the theory. Module federation for loading and sharing code on the one side, web components on the other side for using framework independent components. And now let's try to bring both together. This is the goal of this very session today. And perhaps you're wondering, well, why should I combine those two technologies? Well, there is one good reason for this, namely you get the best of both worlds. Because you have module federation, you can share libraries. If two web components happen to use the same library in the same version, perhaps at least in the same major version, that should be enough, then we can share it. If other web components use the same framework in a different version, they can share it. And we can even load another framework. Those framework are abstracted by the API of uh, web components, of custom elements, because the browser is not interested into this. The browser is only interested into the fact that our web component implements the right API. And because of bundling now everything with Webpack or Rollup, we can hide the framework itself in a closure. So we get the best of both worlds, sharing code and using components with different technologies. Yeah, and this is something I want to show you now in action. For this, I have prepared a little demonstration for you. So in this demonstration, I have this example. And at first sight, it looks a bit oversimplified. But if you ask me, it really shows the point of all of this. So what I'm having here is a shell. As you see, the shell is using a specific Angular version. And here I have a first micro front end using the same Angular version. So here we can share this Angular version. Here I have a React application. Obviously, this is not compatible to Angular version 12 dot something. So here I need to load React on demand. The same happens here with this Angular web component. This is just a web component. As you see here, it uses a different Angular version. And so I have to load this Angular version. Okay, I hear you see, say that 12.1 is compatible to 12. So in theory, we only needed to load the higher version. And yeah, you are absolutely right. This is something module federation is capable of. 
if you have one major version, different minors, it can just pick the highest uh, minor version within the major. But here I disable this because my goal is to show you that you can, at least in theory, combine different versions of your framework. So I disabled this fallback to using another minor. 1203. Here I'm also using 1203. That means we can share this Angular version. We don't need to load it one more time. Here also 1203 with some subroots. A few application Angular.js for nostalgic and migration purposes. And here I have a dashboard. Let me reload it. A dashboard that shows everything together in action. So this is what I've told you. Please don't do it. But yeah, technically it's possible. And as we discussed, there might be some good reasons for this. So let me show you a bit of the source code of this. What you see here is the routing table of this shell, the shell that is loading this or that micro front end. And as you see here, this routing table is just using lazy loading. It is just using lazy loading from Angular's perspective. Instead of a dynamic import, I'm using this dynamic helper function. Let me increase it a bit this dynamic helper function that loads this or that micro front end from over there. And this is quite an advantage because it takes dynamic values, just strings, and those strings can come from everywhere. You could load them from the backend. Perhaps you ask the backend, hey backend, I'm now starting up, I'm your front end, do you have a micro front end for me? And the backend says, yes, of course. Here I have this micro front end under this URL. Please find the necessary metadata for module federation here. When it comes to loading web components, however, it's a bit more difficult because with Angular, you cannot root to web components. And I guess also in other frameworks, you might have this issue. You cannot root directly to web components. That's why I wrote a wrapper component. This is just a silly Angular component that takes this routing data. The router in Angular can have a dynamic data, data structure, a data property. And this data, data structure can get uh, key information, key data like this here, like where to find this micro front end. Here you see I've deployed it to the Azure cloud. I'm using uh, Azure static apps, static web apps for this. Quite nice for prototyping. And yeah, here I have other data I need to load and instantiate my web component. And basically this is just doing what I showed you before, creating this uh, element by hand and putting it into the dome, into a defined placeholder. So we can also look into another example. This here is my web component that is using React. So let me jump into the right file. By the way, I'm not a React expert. So if I'm doing here anything uh, that is not the fine English way of doing things, please don't be mad with me. Uh, here I uh, just wrote this simple React application it's called app. It's also a component. And here you see I'm wrapping it nicely up using a web component and then I'm registering it. And everything I need now in addition for module federation is this webpack config with the module federation plugin. Here I'm configuring my remote. I'm saying, hey, this remote has this name and this is a file a uh, webpack shall generate, it's the file with all the metadata. Metadata the shell needs to load in order to know how to interact with this remote, with this micro front end. And here I'm just exposing the file with my web component, the app.js, under this pretty name. 
That means the shell can use module federation to load this URL. And so it immediately gets my web component that is wrapping my React component. And of course, I don't want to load React several times. That's why I just needed to put here into my shared array. So if the version fits, if two or several micro frontends need the same version, it will just be shared like here. Yeah, that's it. And now you are wondering, are there any pitfalls? And I'm saying, yeah, of course, there are several pitfalls, several ugly pitfalls. Uh, the official name of this talk is quite long. It's a habit of mine. The title is more or less the abstract and the subtitle was called The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. I showed you the good parts, mixing and matching everything, sharing versions. I showed you the bad parts, wrapping web components, telling the router to load the wrapper, which is loading the web components. But there are also some ugly pitfalls. For instance, you might end up with having several routers. A router for the shell, a router for the first micro frontend, a router for the second micro frontend. And somehow each router thinks it is the only router in your browser window. So each and every router thinks it has the full control, it has the full ownership of the URL. But this is not true when you have several routers in combined micro frontends. And so you might need to tweak your, your router a trick uh, a bit to use some helper functions to disable the router or to use fallback routes and so on and so forth. It's doable, but uh, you need some, some, uh, some motivation for it. And of course, some time to deal with those workarounds. Obviously bundle size can also become a pitfall because it's very likely that when loading different micro frontends using different frameworks, that you have an increased bundle size. When it comes to Angular, there are some additional issues. For instance, uh, in Angular, there is a thing called a platform. You need it to bootstrap your application. But the thing is, you are only allowed to instantiate your platform once per Angular version. That means we need to find a way to cache this platform and reuse it. And also this is Angular specific. Angular is currently still using Zone.js. And this is just a third, I wouldn't say a third party, but it is uh, yeah, a different package you need to load in addition up front. And so you'll need to make sure you only have the newest version of Zone.js and to load only one version of it before you load all the other micro frontends. I've written about those tricky details and pitfalls in this blog article. You can look it up. Very likely you can transfer the ideas from here to other frameworks like React View and so on. By the way, besides my package that helps you to deal with module federation in Angular, there is another package that automates all those ugly workarounds uh, so that you don't need to write them by hand. Those are not the solutions you deserve, but sometimes the solution you need and that's why wrapping them in helper functions is a good idea, if you ask me. So check this out to learn more about those ugly pitfalls. Okay, cool. Let's come to a, to a conclusion. What did we see today? Well, the first thing we saw was you really need a good reason for doing something like this. You really need a good reason. Otherwise, don't do it. We also saw that using module federation is cool because it allows you to share code, to share libraries. You don't want to load Angular React View several times into the same browser window. 
We saw that web components are also quite nice because they allow you together with your bundler to hide your framework and your versions from other micro frontends. And there is a last thing you also should keep in mind. Perhaps you visit Germany someday, but even though you don't plan to go to Germany, be aware of this creature here. Be aware of the egg lying woolly milk bag because yeah, it can become a Frankenstein monster. It can become quite overwhelming and increase your complexity beyond maintainability. And this is for sure something we want to avoid. Even though it's a nice, funny creature, be aware of it. Yeah, that's it. So thanks for having me. Here you have my contact data. Please find all the material from today in my blog and follow me on Twitter to keep in contact. Thanks. Hey, it's Joe Eames with ng-conf. If you like that video, be sure to click subscribe either here or here, somewhere over here. And if you're looking for something more, here's another video for you to watch here or there or somewhere. <laughs>